Hello, welcome to GUI and in web browsers weekly call. It's 28th of August 2018, and, uh, and we are at the usual time. Um, if you are not on the list of participants at yourself, if you have a topic that you want to discuss, add it to agenda. I've added some items. I see other people added some items, so maybe we'll just jump right into that. I will show my screen. We had some off the, off the record uh, discussion about this call, and uh, we will be trying to make, keep it shorter, maybe 45 minutes next time, or this time. We'll see how it goes. Uh, first item on the on the agenda is, uh, uh, yeah, I created a draft of uh, co-hosting spec. Uh, so for people who were not watching last week, uh, the idea is to create a simple specification for hosting websites using MFS. Uh, and the idea is to use, like, a convention of directories uh, on top of MFS for managing snapshots of specific websites. And uh, the goal of this spec is to use only files API. So effectively, uh, files API should be the only thing you need to use uh, to support this or to manage this. Uh, and the idea is to move uh, away from low-level uh, pinning when it comes to like co-hosting websites. Uh, and we had like uh, some discussion. Uh, did you uh, ask some good questions around use cases? And I tried to uh, uh, push the spec through that lens and commented uh, which things are possible in the scope proposed in this PR and which are not but could be supported either by uh, writing custom code in user land uh, in your app or tweaking the spec a little bit. Uh, so that's a wall of text. Uh, but hey, if, did you find that, was that a useful exercise to push the spec through the lens of things people want to do? Yeah, yes, especially, uh, Especially important part for me was uh, identifying this distinction between people who want to save a copy of a single website and people who want to like co-host entire website, right? So some people care about just one part of website, just, just this page. And other people want to keep the entire example.com or entire Wikipedia online. Uh, yeah, so that's, I, I believe that's a, a good, um, uh, the main question when it comes to, to this version of the spec uh, is where, how do we scope it? So what will be included in this and which things we decide to, to just drop to keep the spec small? The problem is that a lot, like effectively, if you see everything is possible, right? But <laughs> We need, we need to decide where, at w which point we say, okay, enough. And like, personally, I'm biased towards like minimalism and uh, like keeping the spec as small as possible. Just like, just a few directories, uh, like three uh, files, commands for adding, getting, and simple algorithm for like updating. And that's it. And just, just for websites. I'm, I tr like I noted here that we could support uh, specifically like single pages, like sim single paths, but that gets hairy very, very fast. Websites can have uh, sub uh, resources from different paths. Uh, so we either like just host a partial like par part of the website or or even the single page, or do we go to a business of like rewriting HTML? And then if we start rewriting stuff, then we lose the, du the duplication. So you see there, there's a rabbit, quickly, it's a, just a rabbit hole, which I personally, I would like to not go there. 
uh, and just keep it uh, around websites. And yeah, that, that sounds, well, first, thanks for going through and do that scoping because that's so helped me to understand what the spec enabled kind of out of the box versus tweaks. And I think you're right, like this really clarifies what the technology they already have in hand enables easily versus having to do a whole bunch of other higher level application stuff. But I agree, the narrower, narrow and clear in the capability of the spec is, is gonna be the way to, to move quickly and, and iterate on something that is useful to people. And something uh, I realized uh, at some point, oh, yeah, I've added it. So Oli created a command line tool exactly for that. Uh, which I added to the spec in a sneaky way. Uh, however, uh, the idea, the, the way this tool works right now is just like a command line. Let me like make it bigger. Uh, so it's just like a command line tool. You just pass web, like host names of your website and it takes care of fetching it and pinning it. But it's uh, pinning it using this low level IPFS pin command, which uh, just takes a content identifier and pins it, but you are not able to assign like a label. You are not able, you need to remember that, oh, this CID is for this website and you need to like manually manage this. So the, the idea basically is with this spec is to upgrade uh, at some point tools like IPFS co-host to, to make it easier for people to know what they are co-hosting and make it easier for people to people to like decide they want to drop the older snapshots or maybe they want to just stop sharing this website because it's like too, takes too much space or they don't care about this anymore uh, i believe like that would be beneficial because it the tool would work the same but then we you just go to web ui to the files and you will see co-hosting directory and it's like it's basically like self-describing feature. You don't really need to even know that that thing exists. You go to co-hosting. Oh, there's this domain I know, and there is there are snapshots. Um, yeah, I, I think the most important thing for me is that the spec map to the the entirety of the user flow. So, uh, as a user, I want to save something offline to my uh, IPFS local store. I want to be able to share that with other people and I want to be able to go back and read the thing that I saved. And as long as, it, so that there's kind of like, there's this whole, that core set of things that people want to do. And as long as the spec meets that core basic set of things that people want to do with website, then that the tech, checking all those boxes, I think is the key. And that's how we don't end up in the situation where we are now, where uh, there are certain sets of things that you can do sometimes with some things. Yeah, uh, I believe like what needs to be done to this like proposed spec, like right now is like very technical, mostly like oriented if you want to implement this, right? But I believe we should add uh, like a section of like use cases. Maybe not, I'm not sure it should be spec or maybe in readme, but basically uh, take this list and decide which we include in spec, which we don't, and, uh, and, and just write it down, what this spec enables and wh which watch it, what is not in the scope of this spec, and just write, write it down. Uh, I'll probably do that, uh, and then we'll uh, make a final pass uh, on this. It, it, it does not seem to be very controversial. Uh, I'm interested in the pattern of like, we well, kind of in the well-known directories zone mm -hmm. and we've talked about it in the past, but it's one of those things where like, it's got some um, real simple user experience qualities about it. Like it's very easy to explain to users, but it feels also like very fragile or at least like, uh, it, it's a mutable file system anyone can call. There's, there's, no, there's no control on this, and there's no guarantee that what you find in the co-hosting directory is in the format that you expect. 
and this may be the right way to go, but it's just like an interesting like first example of like trying to trying to make a formal proposal to make that a thing. And every time we talk about it with everyone, like no one spent enough time thinking about the trade-offs of using the well-known directory pattern. Certainly amongst us, uh, no one's got really strong. Everyone's like feels a bit floppy, but it is kind of easy to explain. <laughs> I, I'd merely offer this up as like background to to the conversation. Uh, I don't want to I don't want to derail it because of it, but it it's I, it's uh, that zone. I totally agree and sort of yeah. been thinking on this uh, on my own. M namely, I know it's like going into like bike shed area, but we need to go there uh, at some point. Uh, like this proposal of like putting directory in the root, it's like just like a placeholder because uh, like it's nice, it's in the root and people immediately see this. However, we could have like actually like that well known directory under which we would put stuff like that and then we would uh, we could present that directory uh, differently in web ui uh, that's a question like how much we want to uh, invent new things uh, right now we just add a directory to mfs i believe if we decide to not put it directly on the root but in like that config or that well known uh, director as a subdirectory of well known directory uh, that could be still acceptable, but anything like more than that it's it's probably uh, diminishing returns and like introducing uh, multiple layers of directories for people to click through which is like my fear yeah yeah. Uh, in, in its kind of purest form, it feels a bit like the movement of convention over configuration. Like, it's really clear. Everyone knows it. It's just like, oh, the co-hosting directory, that's where websites go, which may be a strong reason to at least, like, run with this spec, see how it, see how it's, a, what people feel about it, and, and then it maybe gives more value to the whole MFS abstraction. Or people hate it, and we know that we should like use IPLD for this sort of thing in the future. But I guess without actually like using it in anger for a thing like this, we don't. We will be sort of having the conversation about how do we feel about it forever. <laughs> I I recommend uh, in the spec talking about the well-known directory pattern and acknowledging that it's a vector for experimentation and for playing with ideas like this in really agile ways without requiring protocol changes mm -hmm. like i think if you kind of call that out at the beginning like we know there's this architecturally fragile bit here we are taking advantage of the fragility in order to get to be able to experiment easily and quickly yep and i also believe uh, it could be interesting uh, to turn this like anxiety around like just adding directories to MFS uh, as like a forcing function to think how could we improve MFS uh, it's sort of like my pet project to pet project or like pet idea to turn MFS which is like a ridiculous name and now everyone is using it for some reason people uh, to to move from this like very proprietary uh, name to to better abstraction, like a dr drive, and you can have multiple drives. So for now, we could just, we just put this co-hosting directory into one MFS because we have just one MFS, but maybe in the future, each co-hosted website could be on its own drive, which has a separate access controls, things like that. So uh, like, the fact that we don't have those things right now and we put uh, it on MFS could serve as the need for uh, implementing or at least discussing those things. Um, so I feel it's, uh, it's probably not, like, not a super priority, but we we'll slowly should iterate on this because uh, it may open interesting discussions at some point. Well, should we... Uh... Head to the next agenda, Adam. Yeah. We got a we got a bunch. Yeah, we got a bunch, and 
Uh, all right, uh, IPFS provider v2, that this one is mine. It will be probably fast. Uh, IPFS provider is a library, JavaScript library that aims to make it easier for people to add IPFS uh, as, a, as a, like a backend service <laughs> or like a background service uh, of the web app without worrying too much about uh, where the actual IPFS daemon come from. So a lot of apps would just want to add some data to IPFS and get CID and vice versa. Uh, so IPFS provider is a way of uh, introducing a very elegant heuristic when you uh, try to connect to users uh, go I, IPFS node running on their own machine uh, be that uh, if user has IPFS companion or uh, has go IPFS running on localhost IP uh, in a way that will work for people who have not installed those things so you may try IPFS uh, IP, uh, API provided by I, IPFS companion uh, if there's none then you try some HTTP API, but if that API is down, then you fall back to embedded JS IPFS, which still lets you uh, access data on IPFS. Um, that's that's the that's the dream. Uh, we have the current version is like a port of old tool we used internally. However, the issue I linked and added to the agenda is a discussion about uh, and programmatic interface which would be very clear to understand and very easy to customize both which providers you want to enable and in which order. So here we see, uh, I first want to try some HTTP API, then I want to fall back to uh, interface provided by a browser extension. And if neither of those work, I want to fall back to embedded JS IPFS with some a custom configuration uh, and and this is like an issue where we discuss uh, how this future interface could look like uh, but basically what we want for people is to just uh, call this get IPFS and they should get a working IPFS API instance that they can interact with uh, that's more or less it uh, and the questions to this one or yeah is, is that I guess you know I mean, there's probably a lot of reasons why you would want to choose to be specific about those fallbacks and not just have a kind of like deterministic fallbacks based on a, a set of things, ideal settings that we thought. It might be good to enumerate what the reasons are why people would want to do this in the, in the readme for this. Yeah, totally. Uh, the, the, the background on this is uh, Internet Archive it would be one of, you, of users and uh, the way they want to, this to work is they probably, they are running their own nodes, I believe. So they wanted uh, to try API first and then fall back to embedded JS APFS or vice versa, I, I, I never remember. Uh, but I know it was like very unusual and in the old library it was not possible. Um, similarly, uh, window IPFS is interface, experimental interface provided by a browser extension, but some people want, it comes with limitations. It comes with like sandbox for file system API. So some application uh, which need access to like regular full files API might decide to just disable this the provider because it does not provide the full IPFS experience. So uh, those are like two from the top of my head, but totally. Well, yeah, I'd, I'd say just add a, a description of those so that people looking at it understand if they need it or why they would need it. Yeah, yeah, I, I believe like we, we should like list uh, examples of scenarios with like those uh, code samples that show the order with some custom uh, configuration. That's a good illustration. Why would someone would want that? Yep. Um, next one. Yeah, I see I've added like, I should randomize those. So I'm not uh, talking all the time, but uh, the, another one is uh, I created today. 
Uh, it's about missing docs on setting up own bootstrap node with WebSockets over TLS, which I was sort of su surprised. Uh, the, the, the problem is that actually we have uh, like regular docs in Go, we have regular docs uh, about configuration in JS APFS, and if you read all those docs, you may connect to dots and figure out how to set it up, but effectively, a lot of people would like to run their own IPFS node on the backend, be that uh, JS IPFS or Go IPFS, and have that backend service expose WebSocket uh, endpoint. For the, thin, for the JS IPFS running in the website, to use it as a bootstrap node. So the idea is that, uh, like right now, if you run JS IPFS, it uh, will, if you run JS IPFS with default configuration, it will spawn and try to connect to a list of default bootstrap nodes, which are provided by a IPFS project and the P2P project. The problem is, uh, it's like a list of eight servers, which, uh, which we always try when we try to reach out to, uh, to the swarm. And if you are building a web app with IPFS, you probably want to at least add some additional bootstrap nodes to ensure that your application remains functional and is able to connect to uh, the swarm, even if the public default uh, bootstrap nodes are down. Another uh, reason why you want to use custom bootstrap nodes is uh, our limitations of JS IPFS in the browser context. Uh, so you, in, when you are in the web, running JS IPFS in web browser right now, you don't have DHT. You may do DHT queries using delegated routing, and you may preload some content you want using preload nodes. So, but this is where your custom bootstrap node comes in because if you add your Go IPFS or JS IPFS as a bootstrap node. Uh, to your uh, JS IPFS running on your website, uh, the same node can act as preload and delegated uh, router, um, which improve content discovery. And in general, if you want to set up like a play a video player or you have a data set that you know your J uh, embedded JS IPFS uh, will want to access, ensuring it's already connected to a node with that data improves that content discovery speed. So that's a very long uh, preface why this mat use case matters. And the problem is we, we, we are missing a good like one-stop uh, tutorial uh, for setting this up because there's a caveat. The caveat is that uh, WebSocket transport is uh, supported by Go IPFS, but it's disabled by default. And it's disabled by default because uh, by default, it's not encrypted. It's just WebSockets without any encryption on top of it. And most of uh, deployments will run on HTTPS, which means uh, JS IPFS won't be able to connect to unencrypted WebSockets. Uh, if you want to use uh, JS IPFS on a website on HTTPS, you need your WebSocket port to be also uh, wrapped in TLS. And that's what the problem, uh, that's the problem. Uh, it's not easy because Go IPFS does not support HTTPS, does not support like WebSocket over TLS. So we need to put Nginx or other reverse proxy in front of Go IPFS and set up certificates there, ensure WebSockets are wrapped in TLS and all, and then like multi others for this endpoint will be different. Like unencrypted is slash WS, encrypted is slash WSS, uh, stuff like that. Um, so I believe that's a, a big uh, hole in our documentation that we don't have like one stop for that. A lot of people would love to run their own, uh, but right now it's really, really tricky. I was looking at the ways we could, anything we could link or anything I could like in, extract into like quick tutorial and I was not able to. 
So for now, I just ask anyone uh, excited about this or uh, who already set this up on their own to either comment on this issue or post like, if there are tutorials out there, just post them. But uh, I believe I was not able to find anything uh, like ad hoc. So I believe we should create one and in JSIPFS repo, there's like a docs directory, which is a bit lonely right now. It's, it's just like a doc about config, but I believe like we should land it here, like how to run your own bootstrap node or how to use your own bootstrappers, something like that. Um, yeah, that, it might be, would be cool to be able to put just a whole bunch of skeletons of docs in there, docs we wish we had. Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, I believe like a lot of people in the community already did that. Uh, the problem is that you, that you did that and you, and you just moved on and other people have the same problem. So uh, I was really surprised we did not document this. So it's something I want to improve. Uh, and that's it. I promise to shut, shut up now. <laughs> Uh, the next agenda item is me and around the issue that Hack posted about his uh, unit test and uh, mock explosion. Uh, Hack, did you get, I haven't looked at the issue in a couple of days. Did you get the feedback you needed there in order to move forward on unit test design? I think Hack yes. has uh, problems with his internet connection today, yeah. unfortunately. I can hear you now, but I can't see anyone. Just gray screens, the gray boxes. Uh, so yeah, this was just a question about the, if you got what you needed for the uh, unit test design to uh, go, before you go down the road of creating thousands of mocks. Um, uh, I, I've merged the PR, but I still have a question about them. See what uh, to ask what you think about it. Like some of the modules I'm testing require other modules from the uh, from the. It's a good practice. I searched online. Some people say it is. Some people say it isn't. So I, I'm not sure if it's a good idea to use it. What do you think? Do Do you have an idea of kind of like what the up, what the upper bounds would be of? Uh, what do you mean? Like, is if you have to import all this stuff and write all these mocks, like, do you have an idea of uh, like, is there is there a set list or will it only keep growing? Uh, yeah, I believe it would, would, will keep growing if I make unit tests for every, everything, every file we have on so. so I guess because maybe... All yeah. You went, you went robotic at the end there. But I guess, yeah, if I, from, from, if we, if these are areas of tests that we are finding uh, bugs in, then maybe it's worth doing that investment. But if it's not, then at the time, I mean, Maybe it would be if we are if we don't have integration like end-to-end -end integration tests that would catch something like the smoke test that would catch the same issue, then maybe it would be better to spend the time in that. But if the unit tests are an area that we are regularly finding kind of issues that they would, these tests would catch, like looking back at some of the bugs that we've discovered or shipped or found, if the if the unit tests seem like they would catch those, then then it seems like a thing worth doing. Uh, like the the test I made I made now probably wouldn't have like s most of the bugs we we've had in the past are like really stupid things just like a missed me missed 
typing and stuff like oh, uh, mis uh, misspoken something like that uh, word uh, in the code. So I, I believe it would work. We have uh, some end-to-end -end tests, but they are only test the launch process. I like to test more of the web UI integration, although I haven't had yet time to check that out. And also, and it is related to the next max point in the agenda. There are a lot of issues with the build process. Would the unit test catch some of these build process issues? Is that how are they related or are they related in a different way? Uh -oh. I think I'm not hearing anything. Like Yep, we lost him. Hello? Hello? Hey. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay. So I don't know what you heard, so I'm going to repeat what I was saying. I'm just mostly concerned about the size of the MOX folder directory. Because it seems that if, if I continue to make unit tests for all of the code of IPFS desktop, I will need to mock almost all external packages we require and a lot of internal modules of IPFS desktop. And I didn't know if that was a good practice or not. <laughs> Yeah, that I mean that's yeah. always, that's always the uh, the risk with mocking, right? Is like you'll have an infinite list of things that need to be mocked, and then the system changes, and you have to rebuild the model. Yeah. So you end up doing this this non non trivial slice of work is permanently managing the mocks at that point. So I think um, what right before you cut out, you were talking about how this is related to kind of the build issues that you're talking about below in the next item. And uh, so I think, you know, it, you're the best person to kind of make the decision as to whether or not the, the work doing unit tests and mocking will solve or catch the type of, of issues that come up first. But um, it sounds like the, the build issues are probably a higher priority. C c yeah, do you want to skip down to that item? The build issue. Yeah, sure. Uh, I, would like, uh, I would check my screen, but I, my internet is not capable capable of doing that. So I ask you to open the, the issue, please. Uh, I have the, I have put the link yeah. on the notes. So the first problem is fetching web UI. Like right now, when we type npm install, we fetch the web UI from ipfs.io. The problem is that the latest web UI version is not pinned to the gateway, but it's pinned to the cluster. In normal synchronous senses, it would work, but right now the gateway can is having some connection problems with cluster, so the builds are all failing on all CIs because of timeouts. And there are two solutions. Uh, I've talked with all about them. He suggested to make webui.ipfs.io the latest release version and dev.ipfs.io the latest commit, so they would both get pinned to the gateway, and the other option would be to add a git module to access the sub repository. So we could build web UI on the fly, but that would require more, more burn. like when updating the web UI, we would need to update the commit on the repository instead of the single hash. What do you think about that point? Which, which solution seems better? Does the submodule solution make it easier for doing local testing as well? Or does it not matter? Uh, or is this only for CI? 
it's all also for like we don't use a web UI for the for testing. It's only to add to the the final binary to have web UI show up in the in the screen. So it wouldn't matter much, but on CI it's I believe it would be better to uh, to have a Git submodule because right now clearly Git is a bit more reliable than our Git. So it wouldn't be an issue. But if the, we had the latest web UI pinned to the gateway, the, la the latest release version and not the latest commit, it would also solve the problems. Although it would still be a little bit more unreliable, perhaps, I don't know. A little more unreliable, do you say? Yeah, perhaps. Yeah. We could try it out and see if it works. Yeah. I prefer the first solution. The second one would need uh, would require us to update the, the specific commit of the submodule, which would make a bit. Mm. It wouldn't be uh, a big problem, but right now we when we release a new version of Web UI, we just uh, get the hash and update on GS IPFS, go IPFS, desktop, yeah. and then desktop would have a different updating process. We would need to update the submodule. Yeah, it, see, it seems like the, the first solution is a, a little easier to do and requires a little less manual intervention. Yeah, well, just let's move for the second topic. Electron Builder is failing on Linux releases on Travis. So that's Builder seems to have a bug on this version that makes it fail on Travis. Uh, Cinder opened an issue on the, the repo 20 days ago. They said nothing. They, repo they didn't reply. There's no activity on the repository since 18 days ago or something. Uh, I could downgrade the Electron Builder version, but that would, requ would require me to downgrade the Electron version which would also require me to change, make some changes, uh, reverse some changes of the code. And I don't know if this is only uh, happening on Travis. I, by typing, uh, by running this on a uh, uh, virtual machine, it works. So I believe it's a Travis specific problem and it would work on other CI like Circle. And uh, I told Paul it, to on Monday about this, and they suggested me to try Circle since it, they now have support for Windows and Mac. Uh, I, I think that's a good idea, uh, but I'm not sure if the price of Circle CI would be worth it because Circle needs a paid plan for Mac OS and Windows. And I don't know if that are, would be a cost uh, like. Are we already using Circle in other places? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, web UI. Uh, yeah. Generally, like file calling is using that for everything, I think. Uh, so okay. our infra team should be able to help or at least like answer questions about it. Okay. Um, How easy is that to try out? Like for, should we just get you a, a circle account through infra and then you can see if it fixes the problem or is it something where it would take a pretty big amount of migration to be able to see if it fixes the problem? I've already cre uh, created a branch, a branch to try out circle. It's not working yet, but that's my fault. <laughs> um, but it's only t uh, testing on Linux. Oh, okay. It's not actually my fault. It's Gateway's fault because it can't download Web UI and so it fails. So I can't really test the tests and the build process. But this is only for Linux. I, I need to be able to run this on Windows and Mac OS to, to make sure it would work flawlessly. I mean, it seems like having uh, all our CI on on one system makes sense and would be good, but I, I have no idea how many other repos are using Travis or Circle or other things. 
Yeah, like uh, Travis also has Windows support now, but they have some issues. This is a funny thing. Appware almost never fails downloading from the gateway. And Travis does, which is weird. That is weird. I mean, it kind of reflects the pattern we're seeing of, of gateway failures generally, though, where it yeah. works fine for A, but not for B. So I believe now I, uh, we need to fix like the, the fetching web UI part, and then I can try Circle CI when we have a more reliable solution for fetching the web UI. I believe that's the, the, the way to go. It's just an idea uh, around uh, like downloading uh, things that we need from uh, our gateway. Uh, uh, yeah, so I believe we, we had this issue in, in other places and uh, generally like the problem is with uh, Anycast, which just pins you to a specific uh, uh, instance of our gateway. We have like multiple instances uh, in, in different parts of the world and uh, that's why same thing works for one person but does not work for Travis because it's using like effectively a different machine uh, mm. which might not have the, the same data in the cache and stuff like that. But for you, specific use on our CI is that we actually know, have an, we have like direct aliases for each uh, geographical instance of our gateway. So I'm not sure if it's a pattern on an anti-pattern, but it's a pattern uh, to just try them in order and basically like sidestep the anicast. So instead of being rooted to that one specific instance of our gateway, I'm not, I wonder if it would uh, be beneficial to solving this problem to just try, okay, the US one does not work. Let's fall back to the one in Frankfurt. Uh, I, you may ask Oli about like details, how to mm -hmm. request, uh, like request uh, data through our gateway from a specific like uh, geographical instance. I'm not sure if it will help, but maybe it feels like something worth looking at before we go into the rabbit hole of moving to a different CI infrastructure or things like that. Maybe that will be enough. Yeah, like that would, would solve the web UI issue, but not the Electron Builder. If the Electron Builder is still failing on Travis, we couldn't make releases anyway. That's true. And, yeah. And I don't know, the main maintainers said, uh, I haven't replied yet, so, and it's been 20 days, perhaps they're on vacation, I don't know. <laughs> mm. I feel it, it may be useful to, to see how much time it will take to go to the Circle CI. If you feel it like it's eating too much of your time, uh, we, we can like revisit it before like investing too much time into the migration because we we've been like switching from jenkins to travis from travis to circle uh, it's actually apss desktop has been really stable we've always been using travis with that player <laughs> <laughs> lucky you <laughs> the problem is only like right now fetching web ui after solving that uh, we still have the Electron Builder problem. Like, there's an issue uh, about uh, not not being able to start IPFS desktop on Linux on the beta releases, and that's my fault because I built the binaries on a virtual machine and uploaded them because it wasn't working on Travis and they. Uh, I should have set like uh, different, some weird option for sandboxing on Linux that I didn't know about. And this is not a, a good way to make releases, definitely. Also on Linux, it's 
not all distribution uh, LPCs desktop doesn't work on all distributions or all uh, desktop environments. I don't know if that's what they're called. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and so I, I, a quick uh, background on that is that some desktop environments uh, have a, like a tray section when you put, can put like tray icons. Uh, mm -hmm. However, the newest uh, GNOME environment, which is in like Unity in, in Ubuntu, uh, or maybe GNOME 3, uh, either way, uh, some of the latest ones just removed the tray section. And that's the problem because when we start IPFS desktop, the user interface uh, was uh, just uh, just that one icon in the tray. And uh, now when there's no tray, we are not able to open anything. I believe that's one of the problems where there. Yeah, like I don't know if you sh should or not invest in Linux support with like a warning in the readme saying it's experimental. I think uh, like we already have a warning. It's just a matter of uh, someone spending time in uh, like Ubuntu and finding out the way of providing alternative uh, user interface for like opening the me menu because right now the menu mm -hmm. is opened uh, through like the tray area and in some desktop environments on Linux there's no tray area or you need to enable it and most of people don't have it so they install IPFS desktop they click on the icon and nothing happens. I, yeah. IPFS desktop starts and runs in the background, but they have no user interface to open it. Uh, so if someone is listening and is using a, a, like uh, Ubuntu with uh, this type of user interface, uh, it would be useful uh, to at least figure out uh, how to provide an alternative uh, user interface. I looked at some uh, Electron and Electron Builder configuration options, and it does not seem to be supported uh, yet. So that's like an open question. Uh, for now, I would just, if we don't have this uh, message that it's experimental, I would add it. If it's there, I would increase the font size. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, perhaps that's a good idea. Uh, yeah, uh, and I generally like uh, uh, maybe add a note that we would we are lo like looking for Linux maintainer or something like that, because uh, that effectively it's problematic. It's e much easier to support Mac and Windows because th those are just two uh, desktop environments. On Linux, you have like multiple. So yeah. Uh, I believe we had, we've lost uh, Dietrich, he had to go to a different meeting. So yep. uh, I'll just quickly open, <laughs> open uh, the last uh, item on, on the agenda and we will wrap it up. Uh, there's an open question, should we exclude uh, gateway paths from being crawled by uh, machines? So things like a Google bot, which is indexing the internet and creating Google search index. Uh, there's a way of excluding specific paths on your website. Uh, I opened an PR just to start this discussion. Uh, should we like exclude uh, gateway paths from being crawled? Uh, and an argument for that is uh, those results are already dropped from the Google search, I believe. They, those were sort of spamming search results because entire Wikipedia got indexed. So yeah. whatever you typed, there was a page on IPFS uh, which shown uh, on the very first, uh, first uh, page. And it was just a mirror of Wikipedia, which was kind of du duplicated. Uh, duplicating content and I believe uh, Google just removed all uh, all those duplicated uh, Wikipedia mirrors um, so when the crawler is uh, browsing the Wikipedia mirror on IPFS it's effectively causing our gateways to load content and put it in the cache even though no one asked for this content and it may it 
kind of uh, triggered other content that people actually cared about to be uh, garbage collected because it was like older and stuff like that. So it's like an open question. Uh, what's the value in being crawled by those uh, search indexes and other automated tools? And if should uh, we, on IPFS IO, should we uh, disallow those paths? And there's a separate discussion, should all public gateways do the same? Or is it something we leave up to the gateway? Should it be a part of the spec? Or is it like an individual decision of gateway maintainer? Uh, we've run out of time, but uh, yeah. <laughs> but it was cool cool hour. Thanks for being being here. Um, and the last uh, last minute items. Mm, no. Nope. <laughs> All right. All right. So thanks for for being here and uh, and see you next week hopefully same time bye bye